We want to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 10 says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. We're made uh, by God to live in community. We're made in his image, which is something we're going to be talking about um, in next week's podcast. But we are made for uh, bonds between other friends and to continue to live in in a faith community. Uh, We're currently in a sermon series in the book of Job. And uh, 35 of the chapters in Job of the 42 have some exchange between Job and his friends. And uh, we see some some good advice from his friends, some sound theological advice. But so much of what we see is is not a good uh, way to present yourself uh, to your friends when they're going through struggle. Um, And so we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, later on, but really we just, we wanted to, it made us think, you know, what's the value of talking through what does friendship looks like, look like, Uh, especially as we become adults, you know, friends as kids and teenagers might look one way, but now that we're adults and uh, moving forward in our walk with Christ, uh, what does it look like to be a friend? And so I'm excited to welcome uh, three of my friends and uh, fellow uh, members here at the church and, and some are in leadership in various capacities. So uh, Rick Fails is joining us from work and uh, Paula, I guess, technically is joining us from work as well. It's just work right across the hall. <laughs> Tasha was gracious enough to uh, leave work for a little bit and then is going to be going back. So how are you guys doing today? Great. Doing great. Yeah. Good. Good. And so, Rick, uh, you showed beforehand, uh, before we hit record, that you did decorate uh, for the occasion. And even though we can't read it, I think you should definitely point it out. Yeah, I mean, the song should now get in your head, and it won't leave your head for the rest of the day, more than likely. So so now people that are watching the video, uh, opposed to just listening, those that are just listening, he printed out a sign that says, why can't we be friends? Um, and so now they will be <laughs> not thinking about anything that we're saying. And that's song's just going to be on repeat. That's right. Tasha, I'm not going to sing it. Yeah, you're not going to sing it. <laughs> there you go. You at least know the song we're talking about, right? Okay. Well, sing, it. sing it, Tasha, so you can confirm that. Baby friend. There it is. There you go. It's just, yeah, you're significantly younger. So I. I <sighs> significantly Okay, sorry. He's significantly <laughs> younger than me. I won't say Paula's relation and age to me. <laughs> so, oh, no, you don't. Know, yeah, you're, you're on assessment if she's significantly younger than you. I was just speaking for myself. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, man. So uh, as we jump into this topic of friendship, um, I, I want to you know, read a a section of verses. We already jumped in uh, with Ecclesiastes, but there's another section of Ecclesiastes that we hear, um, you know, read all the time or speaking of songs, uh, we hear sung all the time, all the time by the birds way back in the day. Uh, But it's not typically a section of verses that are used when thinking of friendship. But I still love what it says in Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 4. It says, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to uproot, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to tear down, and a time to build, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. Mm -hmm. And, And if you think about it, a lot of what they're talking about in life, even though I've never thought about it necessarily as a passage on friendship, for me, uh, as I was preparing for this, it really made me think about when I think of all of those times that it's listing, I actually looked back and think about those friends that walked beside me mm-hmm. in those times. Um, the the friends that were there uh, that were celebrating with me during the times to laugh and dance, but also that were, were crying beside me in the times to mourn. Um, and so there really is uh, an importance of friendship, but also it reminded me there's a season to everything. 
Um, friendships have seasons. As much as we wish friendships never ended, uh, for some of them, for some we wish we would they would end and they won't. Um, but <laughs> that's a different topic. Uh, but yeah, like there's seasons to friendships. So I'd love to hear from you guys. What what was a season um, of friendship that was a challenge for you? And what I mean by that is maybe not what what was a friendship that was a challenging friendship, but a transition of, you know, hey, I'm no longer a teenager now. What does it look like to be friends as adults? Or what does it look like now to be friends as I'm single and my friend's married or I'm married, my friend's single or we're both married? Um or now I have kids, they don't, or they have kids, I don't, you know, like there's a lot of seasons in life that change. What, what have been some difficult seasons for you um, to, to just basically be friends with people? I, I feel like I'm really blessed in the sense that um, I was fortunate enough that a lot of, most of, uh, my friends from my late teens, <clears throat> the the friends that I forged really uh, through uh, church and the ranch, uh, you know, the vast majority of those friends are still people I absolutely call friends uh, today. Um, that's rare. And I know that. Uh, so I consider that a, a, a big time blessing. But, um, you know, I, I like the way you put it when you look back on seasons. Mm hmm in most cases you remember the relationships you had during those seasons. In a lot of cases you remember those the most about that season. Um, Cause I look back and that's so true in my life as well, that I equate years and, and uh, memories and, and seasons with, you know, who did I know in that time? Um, and so <laughs> I could have sworn I locked that door. Um, anyway, <laughs> Um, you know, those, I look back at times and seasons and, and, and eras of my life and, and I, it's about the people and, um, it's always about those connections that you had because that's what, for me, that's what makes that season or breaks that season in so many cases. Um, and so, yeah, now, and I, I will talk more about this as we go. I know, but like, I feel like I have so many seasons and so I have so many different sets or groups of connections, relationships, friends yeah. from each of those seasons. And um, it's a really, it actually helps me to, to date certain things. Like what was I doing then? Well, I knew this person. Um, yeah. it, so, so it was this time frame. It had to be yeah, in, in between <laughs> these years. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's really, um, the way that works but the other interesting dichotomy about friendships over the years is and, and let's just use the high school um or college time frame uh, for reference um you know i i had a fair amount of friends in high school um but i'm not friends with i don't think any of them now i wouldn't call it friendships you know yeah. if i saw them in the street i would say hi and smile sure um but uh, those weren't deep connections. Those weren't lasting connections. Um, you know, my deep lasting connections were those relationships that I forged at church and at camp. And I think it's because those are people that are very like-minded. Those are people that I trusted then and trust now still. Um, so it was a deeper, uh, a deeper sense of friendship. Uh, and those are the ones that have stood the test of time. Um, and so that, you know that I think that that's really interesting because the, those relationships that you forge that have depth, that have trust, that have shared um, experiences of really hardship or elation, um, you know those those are the enduring relationships. And pretty much every relationship I think I had in in that was that was more secular was always surface level, so it didn't last. Yeah. So Tasha, how about you as Maybe I shouldn't reference this at all. I was going to say someone who has not had as many seasons, uh, just because of life experience. You haven't. You've you've definitely had seasons, but someone who, uh, as you've gone through, have you hit any seasons where you're like, man, this is difficult. This is not what I, what I knew to be making friends and keeping friends and being a friend. I would say like 
after college, it got really hard because throughout your entire life, you're with people all the time. And mm-hmm. like, yeah, people, you're doing the same thing. So it's really easy to be like, oh, I enjoy you. Let's be friends. Yeah. But there is no real, like, that thing that brings everyone together all the time consistently where you're like, almost forced to make friends. It's harder to, like, keep friendships and, like, for, like make that are healthy because everyone's trying to figure out what they're doing and like they're it's not a time where you're really like outwardly focused i feel like and so Mm -hmm. it's hard to find friends that one love the lord and take their like faith seriously and to have the time or like have it be a priority to have deep friendships and not just surface level friendships i feel like that is like the season that I find the hardest regarding friendships. Yeah. And I think it's interesting. I mean, I obviously lived it. We all did, but I never thought about the, one of the difficulties of friendships in that stage of life is because you're so focused on trying to figure yourself out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like you don't even know who you are now that you technically are an adult and on your own. Uh, in some ways. And so because of that, you become more inwardly focused and just don't have that, you know, uh, that same capacity or same awareness to be looking outside. Uh, That's interesting. Paula, how about you? I think as far as challenging goes, I made a really big move in my late 20s, um, leaving my home church and coming out Mm -hmm. to this church, Federated Church. Um, and not all of those friendships, uh, transitioned. Yeah. And that was a very interesting season because when you're in ministry, which a lot of my friend group was together, you are going with each other almost 24 (laughs) seven. It's a very intensive friendship because you have this common goal of ministry together. And when I left that, many of them continued on in that capacity and I didn't, I went somewhere different. And so there was a transition there that was was pretty challenging just because my not just my season of life, but my physical self went somewhere else. And so not every relationship transitioned with me. It is amazing how once we're adults. Changing your address by 10 miles <laughs> And changing either your place of employment or your place of worship, mm-hmm. like cuts a lot mm-hmm. of friends out of your life. Mm-hmm. It's not, not intentionally. It's just there's only so much capacity. There is. And there's so, like logistics to it, too. I mean, yeah. when you're doing life with people and you're mm-hmm. in proximity with people on a regular basis, that's how those friendships deepen. When that's yeah. removed, you have to be far more intentional And if you don't either have the capacity or the willingness to be intentional, you'll notice some of those friendships begin to to dissipate, unfortunately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and they just fade. And so we we see if we keep reading through. I guess maybe I'll, I'll answer also the season. I don't know. I've been blessed that, like Rick said, I've been blessed to have uh, the rarity of like. I have a group of friends that I have not known life without Mm -hmm. almost, you know, like, and I have a group of friends that like the one I met before kindergarten, one of my first earliest memories and and the one I rode the kindergarten bus with. And uh, there was one other that moved in, I think in second grade and, you know, then at church, that's like, Oh, well this group of friends that I'm still close with, they were just always at church. I don't ever remember them not being, you know, and so they've they've been there through, you know, through my life. But I think for me, possibly for some of my friends, the hardest season was I didn't get married till I was 30. And so there was a group of friends that were getting married mm-hmm. and were like, uh, it, it was just it was a weird transition in that stage of life when in my early to mid 20s as my friends were getting married um it was just a yeah it was for some that was when things just kind of faded and in our friendship just 
uh, not in a bad way, but it just capacity of time didn't really, you know, uh, continue. Um, and so I think looking back, that's probably the season for me that maybe was, was the most difficult was navigating that. Um, going back to what I was going to say though, if we continue reading in chapter three, uh, you know, it says in, in verse 11 that he has set eternity in the human heart. And so there is an element of eternity that is set in our heart. And we know that. And so I wonder, one, why do you think we struggle so much with with uh, seasons of friendships ending? Um, and at what element is it a reminder that Christ is the only one that will ever be that lifelong eternal friend? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, like, I, I guess I'd love to hear you guys talk through that as, you know, maybe you uh, using an example of a, a friendship that you thought, oh, we were going to grow old together. And now we don't even talk, yeah. you know, um, and just what that looks like. I had. Um, and I would still consider her a friend in the sense that the friendship kind of got lost, but not because of a negative reason. Yeah. But in my early years of ministry, so this would be like late 90s, um, I found a friend who was also a young, single women, uh, female youth pastor, youth director, yeah. which was not common at that time. We were kind of a rarity. And so we got connected And it was like that immediate, like soul sister, like you just knew that we were supposed to be friends. And for probably, I don't even know, eight years or so, we would meet every Wednesday morning at Barnes and Noble on (laughs) beach and just pour into each other. And we saw each other from, you know, young single youth directors to being in each other's weddings, to being there for our first baby showers. Like we truly did life together. And it was another one of those scenarios of moving away, pursuing other things. She was in Australia for a year and we tried so hard and then life took over. And for whatever reason, that was probably, this is probably the one relationship in my life that I could look at and say, that was for a very particular intentional season that God placed us in each other's lives to carry each other through what felt like a very lonely position to hold in ministry and to know that we had each other. I really believe got us through because we were able to, we would get together and each we take one hour, you go, then I'll go. And we would just word vomit on each other. (laughs) It was so life giving to just, to walk through our journeys together and all that life yeah. threw at us over that almost decade. So um, that's one that still breaks my heart. I'm not going to lie. It's hard. It's hard to yeah. not, you know, do that life with each other, but I will, I will never regret that time we had though in, in mm-hmm. that very intentional friendship. It was, it was, yeah, it was a, a relationship that I'll always hold dear in my heart. Yeah. I think we're all built very relationally. Um, Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of scripture that speaks to that as well, that we're inherently um, relational, some more than others, for sure. Like, I actually don't really consider myself very good at being relational, but but we are all built that way. So when you have friendships and you have relationships and they, for whatever reason, stop. Uh, there's, there's going to be a bit of a grieving process. I don't think anybody starts a friendship expecting it to end mm-hmm. um, or knowing that it will or thinking or wanting it to, you know, so you, yeah. you have an expectation that, that that friendship will just go. And then when it, when it falls off, um, yeah, there's going to be some grieving uh, associated with that because it's just the way we're wired. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it, you know, there's, it, I think it's healthy um even if it is hard um mm-hmm. but you know that that the, the eternity mindset i think that that's why i really think that that's why our relationships and friendships with those who have deep shared experiences uh, and are you know our christian friends um are typically going to be those more longer enduring um uh, relationships because there's more of a recognition of that eternal 
um, kind of way of, of being relational uh, that's going to be built into um, those of us who are thinking more eternal uh, with our yeah. with our spirit. So, um, but yeah, when you when that when one of those relationships fades away, that's there's going to be a grieving process, and mm-hmm. I think we've all experienced that, and it's and it's real. Um, and uh, yeah, that could be tough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To Asha, do you? I'm sure there's still even in your in your youth, um, where you've had some friends that you, like you're like, oh man, maybe the season is over for now, um, and just the difficulty of that. Um. Yeah. I mean, I went to school in Columbus, Ohio, so it's about like three hours, three and a half hours. Yeah. So there's definitely some friends that I loved dearly, but we don't talk a lot because we have different and busy lives. And so that's always hard. But I think sometimes too, in general, we struggle with like trying to personify God. We go to our friends instead of God. Mm -hmm. And we always want to, instead of praying about our problems, we'll go to our friends. And I think like friends are good and they're healthy and like it's good to do that. But I've realized I've had to check my own heart, too, of, like, I can talk to God about this. And, like, God is also my friend instead of, like, yeah. the fact that I've lost this friendship. But knowing that, like, God is still there, even though he can't have audible Tasha, you're being silly type of talk, you know? Yeah, <laughs> that's that's so true. It uh, And, like I said, like, I, I think part of it is why you know, part of why it's ingrained in us is so that we realize that he is the only eternal friend that we'll ever have. Mm -hmm. And he's also the only one we ever need. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, in saying that, he has put people in our lives very much so um, to be friends and and to, you know, iron sharpening iron and, and, and all those different things. But I love the perspective, like you said, to remember that truly the only friend that we'll not have an end of season is the same person that is our creator, savior and Lord. Um, but, but he is, he is called us friend and that's, that is so powerful as well. I think for me, there's definitely, um, some friends that even our proximity hasn't changed. Like neither one of us have moved, but we don't go to the same church. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, wow. Yeah, this is more difficult than I thought to remain as close as we were for a season. And sometimes, like you said, Rick, like there's a mourning process. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know. I've never I've never been in this in this situation. And I don't know if Paula or Tasha have either in, in the sense so you you have your U.S. Marine Corps shirt on. Uh, for those that don't know, you spent 21 years in the Marine Corps. So after a little bit as a protective measure, how did you allow yourself to open up knowing that I, for some of these men, I have three years and then we will never, like we might speak again, but for the majority, there's just no capacity to keep up. And then after three years, I'm going to have another group of friends that I'm going to say I'm going to keep up with, but probably won't, you know. Uh, so how did you discern which ones were worth going beyond surface? And uh, yeah, how did you walk that road? Uh, one way that I can say, and, and I, I want to preface this by saying I didn't always get this right. There were there were some times, there were some periods where I actually would go into a mode of, and Heather would criticize me for this, rightly so, of like, I have no interest in making friends. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to even cultivate that relationship because it's just going to end or um you know we're just going to move on in a couple of years and i would get that and that became that that would take you to a lonely place um yeah you know the recognition of i don't really have any friends here well yeah because i'm not because i'm not wanting them and i'm not trying um so i had to really check my attitude sometimes to not go to that extreme um but specifically to your question um you know learned relatively early on in life maybe earlier than some that that quality over quantity was was a big big factor um yeah i really you know the 
the the growing of the friendship network um, wasn't uh, something that was always that important, but developing uh, a close, enduring uh, relationship, which that aspect is actually relatively easy to do in the Marine Corps because there are so many shared difficult experiences um, that that bond um, is, is, is there uh, in a lot of cases. And, and my closest friends from the Marine Corps, the ones that I still, you know, if, if, if they entered the room right now, it would be as though we never were apart. Those friends are the ones from the hard experiences, the shared suffering, uh, the shared misery of, you know, whichever far off place we were in under whatever circumstances, um, you know, those friendships um, are still deep. I I can still, I don't talk to those folks nearly as much as I want to, but I'll tell you the once a year or whatever that we do, um, it's great. It's as though we had not been geographically separated or, um, or otherwise, um, you know, not been in contact. Um, and those, those friendships are incredibly meaningful, um, to me. And we do occasionally, uh, catch up with those, with those folks because some of them are shared between Heather and I. Uh, yeah. which is, which makes them even better because in some cases it's a husband and wife couple, but in some cases it's just one of those friends of mine who I got very close with. And because of that, they, they would get close with Heather as well. Uh, the one I can think of in particular is, um, uh, well, there's a couple, but you know, one was Ben Broyles. Uh, he was in my wedding, uh, him yeah. and I deployed together. We were very close. Um, but when we became really, really good friends, I was single. Um, but then as Heather and I got together, and she met him and she interacted with him. She developed a very close friendship with him as well. And then his wife. And so we visited them in Texas. Um, and we, I, I very much consider us still very, very close friends because of the depth of that relationship. But to an, again, to answer the question more specifically, it, it's quality. You focus on that. You focus on cultivating relationships with people that you know this is a good person. This is someone I can trust. That is a such a huge aspect of it for me. Um, you know, can I trust this person to, to live life with, um, you know, and to, to be there, um, and to, you know, not, um, not be a negative force in my life. Um, there's, there's a, there's a big element of trust that goes with that. Um, and then, yeah, someone that, that's got some shared experiences, uh, shared ideologies, shared faith, um, and those, it, and then you couple that with shared suffering, um, and those relationships endure, and they and they have those ones that that were cultivated um, really have endured from each of my three year blocks of time throughout the service. Yeah. Um, there's a couple friends from each of those blocks, and, and maybe one or two, maybe there's only one, but. There's somebody from those time frames that I I could call up right now, and it would be a fantastic hours long conversation. And um, mm-hmm. you know, so while that is inherently difficult because you know some of them are in Texas, Maryland, California, Arizona, Europe, um, a couple mm-hmm. still in Japan. You know, so there's a major scattering, and so that is inherently difficult. But man, I still consider it a blessing. I think it's I think it's awesome that. If Heather and I were to travel right now to Europe, there's a couple of people we could go stay with. Yeah. And they drop everything to do that. Um, you know, if we wanted to go out west for a vacation, there's a couple of folks we'd connect with um, and get, get back in touch with. Um, that is that is a neat thing uh, to me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and and it makes and it makes those friends or relationships that maybe weren't healthy or maybe um, aren't that great. It sure does make moving off of them easier. Um, you know, there's, <laughs> <That's true. laughs> you know, yeah. it's, it, there's a natural um, moving on that happens, um, and then you can just choose. Well, so I'll, we won't be in contact again. And and for the ones that weren't healthy for your life, that's okay. Uh, and it's this yeah. natural, not awkward way of severing the friendship. Um, so that's um, that's actually a built-in perk, in my opinion. Yeah. And and so you you spoke to a little bit of, of what Proverbs 12 says of the righteous choose their friends carefully, mm-hmm. you know, 
um, but the way the wicked leads them astray. And you talked about the trust that mattered and what you were looking for. Uh, Paul and Tasha, when you, like, basically when you're looking for someone that it's like, hey, is this someone I, I want to be a friend with or I want to pursue a friendship with, what are some of the characteristics that you look for? I would say honesty and like beauty that they have because especially if they, I mean, there's getting along. I feel like that's a big part of it. If they have a good sense of humor, then we can be friends. Yeah. But then also like I can't have those con hard conversations with me. And it's not going to be like, yeah, Tasha, there's nothing in your teeth. I want to know. Like, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like don't say there's nothing in my teeth, and then all of a sudden I look in the mirror and there's like you know broccoli or lettuce like stuck in there, and you're like, hey, what? Why didn't you say something? Yeah, that's the trust factor, though. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, very much so. There's even how they other people too that like oh. whether they like don't like or people that they don't know. Like I think it says a lot about a person on how they treat someone if that person can't do anything for them, you know. Mm -hmm. It's actually driven, but if there's someone that like, even if you know I'm not gonna hang out around, hang out with them a lot, and you still choose to have a decent conversation, I feel like that speaks a lot to your character. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. Mm -hmm. Paula, what are some things that you you look for along with what they were saying? I need friends who will speak honest truth. <laughs> I don't need enablers because I can get myself down some dark holes sometimes with just yeah. my stuff. And so a friend who will honestly and lovingly speak truth into my life um, is something I really cherish because it's easy to be like a compliant friend where you just, oh, yeah, no, you're good. Or, oh, yeah, I, you know, you should feel this way. I need someone who's not afraid to to just speak speak the truth into my life and remind me of god's promises remind me of who the yeah. lord is remind me of who i am in jesus and and um and not just kind of be uh someone who's a yes man you know who just kind yeah. of makes wants to always make you happy because yeah. i think true friendship sometimes can get a little messy and can get a little um uh rough at times you know so. yes i was gonna say it's uh and, and I've heard this, you know, a number of times and I've said it a number of times. Uh, one of the traits I look for is someone that's going to love me deeply and not be impressed by me. Yeah. Meaning they're going to, you know, they're going to love me and they're going to love me enough to like point some stuff out. Yeah. Um, and, and again, Proverbs again in, in chapter 17 talks about a friend loves at all times. Mm -hmm. and a brother is born for a time of adversity. Mm -hmm. And so going back to Job. <laughs> like we we see these friends show up um and rightfully so they get a bad rap in a lot of ways mm -hmm. um and, and god deals with them in, in chapter 42 mm -hmm. totally different topic but i love how he rebukes them to their face and then says basically and now i'm going to wait to see if your friend who you trashed praise for your for like for you to be spared from what you deserve mm -hmm. well it's it's a it's a growth thing for for job as well that god does but anyways that's totally beside the point um yeah we we look at some of the stuff that job's friends do and i, I do think it was well intentioned at times but they they really kept taking some things and ascribing it to Job that just weren't accurate. Mm -hmm. uh, Job, you must have sinned. Job, you had to have done something wrong. And a lot of their theological logic was sound. Um, you know, there's there's even times when they, they are really speaking the truth, but they're assuming that that truth applies to Job when it doesn't. Right. And so, yeah, how would you say... Um, as as you're walking through seasons of suffering with your friends in tough times uh how can we do better than job's friends mm -hmm. because uh, both of you and ricky didn't say this but i know he very much feels this and and i i'm this way as well 
I need people to point out the broccoli in my teeth. Yeah. You know, yeah. I need people to speak biblical truth to me. Well, Job's friends thought they were. And so how do we, how do we do better in this? And like, yeah, how do we do better? <laughs> this is a tough one because first of all, I loved in your sermon a few weeks ago when you mentioned like they did, his friends did everything right up to a certain point but yeah. um, they spoke really, it started to go off the rails a little bit but but i could relate to that but yeah um, yeah <laughs> it's tough to it's t it's tough for me to be too hard on job's friends I've, I've got a couple points to make but like they i feel like you you've given them credit for being well-intentioned um we have to remember that Job was very early in civilization, yeah. very mm -hmm. early. And so they're advising him uh, harshly at times, but based on what they think they know. Um, they think they're being that friend who's giving that needed tough love. Mm -hmm. um, they really, I, I really believe that they thought that. Um, that they were, you know, and, and based on the law and, and what they knew at the time and, and what little writings and scriptures they had, what they knew of God and what they knew of Job, um, you know, and I have been hard on these three friends in the past, but now that we're really diving more into it, because um, I, I generally avoid diving too deeply into Job, but since yeah. we are doing that now, you know, I'm thinking about it a little bit differently and it's just, I'm finding it actually difficult to, to really be too hard on them because I, I think that they did the best they could with the information they had. Um, not to say that, I mean, they still got, they still got it wrong, but, um, but man, uh, they're human too. Um, yeah. We're, you know, and so I, I, there's a lot of relatability there, but um, you know, and to your point of getting the broccoli out of our teeth, you know, one of the, one of the best interactions I had with a friend, um, and I have talked about this before, um, but, but I think it, it's an appropriate time to repeat it is, you know, there was a guy who, it was a quick friendship, to be honest, because I never, I didn't meet him until we were preparing to deploy to Iraq. And then uh, he was kind of a late join to our team. Um, he was a reservist who had gone active. Um, his name was Micah Fulcher. He was a great, great guy and a very uh, deeply rooted Christian uh, guy. Mm -hmm. um now we deployed and we're out in country and um he had heard me talk about my faith so he knew that that was uh, a real thing for me um and something he told me later was he's like and i intentionally held back and didn't didn't really use that to to connect with you very much because i wanted to s observe you and see what you were made of i wanted to see yeah. how you handled certain situations um and he's like, and I'm very disappointed in you. Um, he's like, you know, you you say that you have faith and you say that you're a Christian, I, I, but I'm not seeing it. And mm -hmm. man, oh man, oh man, I mean, he could have told me anything else. Um, yeah. He could have insulted me in any other way and it would have hurt less than that. Mm -hmm. um, but man, did I need that. Uh, I yeah. needed to hear it. Uh, I it, it, it cut deep. Um, but I, man, I, I respected him for that. Um, and I still think of that day. And you know what? That's not a friendship that's continued much only because of the short amount of time that I, that I, that I knew him. I have tried to connect with him before, but he's kind of that type that's not really online at all, not on social media, not so. And he lives in Alabama and it just, that's a difficult uh, relationship to maintain. But anyway, I, I needed it. I appreciated it. He was there for you know, you talk about God puts people on our paths for sure. And uh, yeah, so that was an issue. That was a situation where um, yeah, there was a lot of value in what he said to me there. Um, it was needed. Um, but, you know, maybe somebody else wouldn't have taken that the right way. First of all, um, you know, the Holy Spirit needed me to, I, it needed to soften me up enough, I think, to take that criticism well um, and, and not immediately get defensive and be like, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, so a question for you, though. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Question: uh, Did he do that privately, just one on one? He did. Okay. He did. Um, and he did it lovingly, but he did it privately yeah. too. 
I remember oh, there, was a look in his, there was a look in his face like, like I, I expected more out of you. Uh, there was yeah. some disappointment there. And I, yeah. Um, so yeah, just, you know, taking that and, and, and looking at Job's friends and it's just like, yeah, they were saying things that were not helpful to Job, but they were giving, like you said, theologically sound advice that wasn't attributable to Job, but dang it, they thought it was. Um, they yeah. thought they were doing the, the, the tough love thing that they thought they should. I really, the more we look, the more I just feel like their intentions were, yeah, it, it, that's a tough one because as humans, we don't, we don't have the bird's eye view always. We don't see the big picture always. Mm -hmm. And we act with the best of intentions with the information we have. And sometimes we're going to get it wrong. And that's where grace is so important. Um, so, yeah. yeah. What about what are some other things as far as like, as you guys walk through struggles, like other people's struggles, what, what have you found to be crucial mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to add to your friendship and to grow it instead of the harmful element that mm -hmm. we see? I think when we when we have a friend who is struggling or when we're the one who's struggling and have an expectation of our friends, yeah, it would be very easy to look from the outside in, which I think was some of the issues that Job's friends were having. Now, I'm I'm standing out on the outside of of where you're feeling, where you are. I'm looking in and I'm making this judgment, this assumption. And here's my input. Here's my advice. Here's my thoughts. But a point that Pastor Rick made on Sunday, which really struck me, was he talked about entering in to the pain and loss of someone. And instead of looking from the outside in to actually go in and enter into their pain, now you're looking at it possibly from your own experience, but or at least trying to take on the experiencing that their experience they're having. I think you're going to have a very different perception and a very different um mindset when you're looking at what they're going through it's easy to look from afar and say you should or you did or why didn't you but to actually if you've ever walked in their shoes or if you try to experience what they're experiencing you're going to come from a very different place all of a sudden you're going to find empathy you're going to find compassion you're going to try to be relatable and uh, i think one of the biggest mistakes is somebody will say to you well you don't know what i'm going through that's a hard line because you may not. And if you and if you're on the other side of that line, sometimes it's really hard for people to let you in and even allow yeah. you to help them because you don't understand, you know, what I'm going through. So true and so important to to really try to, like you said, step in and understand and have that empathy. Yeah. Um, and, and put yourself in their shoes. Mm -hmm. How about you, Tasha? Mm. I would just say, like, pray before you speak. And, like, the times that it's... So know, don't just, like, spew words out and then see how it lands? How they fall. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of times we don't need... My friends don't need my opinion. Mm -hmm. huh. They spirit in that moment. And so, like, instead of just trying to fix it or, like, feel that pressure of, like, the responsibilities on me, realize that, like, it's not your responsibility to fix it. It's not your responsibility to, like, say the right thing so all of a sudden they can pick themselves up. You just have to be there and just let the Holy Spirit do work because that's what's more effective. And, like, yeah, I agree with Paula. It just, like, helps more if they get to say how they're feeling and, like, if you sitting there in it with them, let them explain so that they feel heard in it. Mm -hmm. Someone spewing their ideas when I'm just hurting, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and there's, there is a tremendous amount of wisdom um, that the listening element is something that's so crucial, especially when they're going through the suffering. Uh, and my wife reminds me of this, like, and there was uh, something recently and I forget all the details. Even if I remembered them, I wouldn't share them uh, just because she prefers a little more privacy, but she she said something and I went into fix it mode because that's what we have to do for our family. That's what we have, you know, like and so uh, and then I, I was a few sentences in and I could see the look on her face. I said, oh, you just wanted to tell me you don't want me to fix it. She goes, no. I'm like, OK, 
you know, so yeah. like I said, 14 years in and I'm starting to learn a little bit, you know, <laughs> but, but honestly, like sometimes it is just being there for that friend in the time of struggle and relying, like you said, Tasha, pray, be prayed up yeah. before, in the moment and after. Um, and the Holy Spirit will, will lead you. Uh, and that's one of the things that stands out to me about Job's friends, the reminder uh, like you were saying, Rick, it was so early on. They were doing what they felt was best. It doesn't mean it wasn't happening, um, but we talked about this in staff meeting today. There's no evidence of them praying during this time of giving their advice mm -hmm. to Joe. It doesn't mean that it wasn't happening, but there's just there's no record of it. Um, and, and we also know that the Holy Spirit was not indwelled in that. Like, mm -hmm. right. you know, um, it doesn't mean the Holy Spirit doesn't come up upon them but it didn't say the holy spirit came upon them to give them this wisdom to speak to job um and so there there really was they were they were trying to do their best but i think that's one of the big things um that 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 i would you know like to take away from it um mm -hmm. and i think it's important to remember that um and, and a couple of us have said this uh, a couple of you guys have said this already you know, God puts people in our lives, uh, many cases for a reason and to trust that yeah. sovereignty. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if one of us were to go through something deep and hard and heavy tomorrow, there's a really good chance that there's somebody in our life that can really be a huge help, uh, that the Lord has put there. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I firmly believe that there's sometimes we go through experiences, um, difficult ones, uh, sometimes yeah. with the only purpose of being that person for someone else as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Paula mentioned empathy and it's such an important uh, word and, and um, feeling uh, uh, in a lot of these situations because um, you know, that's actually been a struggle of mine for, for in a lot of areas for a long time is, is empathy. I do struggle mm -hmm. to have empathy for people. It's, I don't like it and, and it's not, um, yeah, it's not it's not a favorite thing of mine at all, um, but I struggle with it. And there's been certain circumstances and things that have happened to me over the last few years that have allowed for me to have so much more empathy for people in ways that I never did before, maybe never could before, because I I truly had no idea what they were experiencing. And I was that guy, and I hate yeah. to admit it. But I've been that guy's like, why can't you just get over that? Yeah. <laughs> a horrible way to feel, let alone a horrible thing to say. But um, that that rigidness uh, that, that's kind of built into me has often been that guy until I experienced certain things. Yeah. And now it's like, oh, yeah, that's why that person can't just get over it. And now I'm seeing certain, you know, things in, in such a different lens and it's been you know there's been a tremendous softening of my heart in certain areas um, that has allowed me to relate to people when they need it um, and has allowed me to just be a better friend uh, quite frankly and um, you know and, and through that the Lord has put me in other people's lives that have needed that um, it's just God's sovereignty is so incredible and, and the way he, uh, he does put people in our lives and the way he puts us through certain circumstances so that we can be that to someone else. Um, I think we need to, to definitely look for that and have trust in it. Um, yeah. We still have to be very careful and selective, I think. And, and to Tasha's point, um, you know, we've got to be seeking the Holy spirit. Um, and if we feel that we're that person, um, I love what you said there, Tasha, go into prayer before we speak so that mm -hmm. It is the spirit speaking to someone and not us because you're right. Rick was right uh, when he preached like that person in that tragic moment and whatever it is, or just a regular time of need. Maybe it's not a tragedy. Uh, good chance. They don't need to hear what I have to say, but there's a hundred percent chance they need to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say. Yeah, for sure. And, and so that it makes me think of uh, one of my absolute favorite uh, passages and stories in scripture is the story of Elijah and Elisha. Um, and obviously this is blowing through so many details, uh, but like, you know, Elijah is used as one of 
the uh, he's used by God to be a tool of one of the greatest displays of God's power in a single moment um, in Scripture in the Old Testament. Uh, he's someone that uh, you know had had a section of time believed to be around a year and a half where the only scripture that were given about that time was his only friend was a raven, you know, that brought him food. And then he had a, a widow and a little boy um, for the next year and a half. So like he's gone through so much and, and God uses them as such an instrument. And then with like a, a drop of a hat, snap of the finger, the queen says, I'm going to kill you. And he goes into deep depression, exhaustion. He's afraid. He runs. He's utterly alone. And God shows his majesty and might. And it's in a still small voice that he hears a whisper. And at the end of that time, as Elijah's begging, take my life, what God truly gives him is a friend mm -hmm. and someone to be a co-laborer in ministry and someone for him to hand the mantle over to um, before he's taken up to heaven. And, and so it's it's just this tremendous thing. And, and obviously, uh, maybe not so much details, but if you think back in your life, was there a time where you cried out to God for relief, for, uh, to, you know, just to, to be delivered from your situation, to be kept from your struggle? And maybe what he gave you was a friend mm -hmm. um, to help you walk through that time. And, and I know that question now. <laughs> no question. And I, I didn't give that to you beforehand, so, no. but it made me think of, you know, just that, that situation. And yeah, I, I know that uh, there's, for me, there's been times in my life where I wouldn't say that it's a new friend like Elisha came. But there's been times when it's it's been a struggle and there's been hardship. And I think I shared this as far as in the discipleship series. I was looking for someone to meet with in uh, like a, a discipleship relationship and someone to pour into my life. And the first person I asked said no. Um, and just because they didn't have the capacity. And so like it was a huge pause and I just like ignored it. And then. Um, you know, long story short, what I wasn't even looking for that then came in was a very significant new uh, person in my life to really speak into my life and to meet with on a semi-regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just been it's been something that's been tremendously life giving over this last six months. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't even know if it's been six months yet, but somewhere around there. You know, and, and it's been tremendous. Um, and yeah, it's it's been good. And if you guys if you guys can't think of something, that's fine. I mean, I can. I I mean, in in, in my season of um, you know grief, um, sadness, yeah. um, God put many people. Um, well, okay, not many. But a few very, very quality uh, people uh, in my path that spoke things to me that um, I needed to hear and and compassionately. So um, I had asked Ken Parmiter to be my accountability partner long before mm -hmm. I kind of was on my journey. Um, and I believe that was a divine thing because then when I was on my journey, Ken was amazing. Um, he, you know, he would text me uh, things I needed to hear. Um, unsolicited and it was always right on time right mm -hmm. so the spirit was absolutely uh, moving there yeah um you know and 20 years ago god gave me the exact perfect life partner in my wife um who was going to stand by me and be strong when you know when when i was needing her to be um and and you know that's been obviously uh just an insane blessing. Um, and then, I mean, you, Mel, um, you know, I've relied on you um, and you came through every time. So um, it wasn't a lot of people, but it was the, the quality of what was put in my path. Um, and I didn't necessarily ask. Matter of fact, I'm terrible 
um, and I can I could I could relate to what was said on the podcast you did about depression with Paula and Amy and um, yeah. Donna. Donna. You know how so many times people going through that type of journey isolate. That yeah. is the natural tendency. Like I I would be pushing away people before I'd be wanting them to come in. Um, and you know I it I I get very rigid and I get very. I'll deal with this. I'll figure this out, um, yeah. which always fails. Always. Uh, I am the worst at figuring myself out. I am not a suitable partner for myself at all. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so God putting these people in my way and, and then softening me enough to be open to that and to hear what they have to say um, and to, to let, people in um has been uh, just incredibly important uh, life-saving really mm -hmm. so we'll wrap up with this i would love to hear from everyone as you look to scripture there's a lot of friendships that we see throughout scripture um is there one that you really appreciate and you really have learned from uh, as an example, obviously, all the relationships between humans are imperfect in some way. Mm -hmm. But uh, what what is uh, one of the friendships in Scripture that you really appreciate and, and you learn from, and what do you learn from them? Honestly, mine. I don't know if this counts because half of this friendship is not. Um, well, no, he was fully human, so we can go there. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I love the I love the relationship between uh, Peter and Jesus. Yeah, and I think it's because we all have that friend who's kind of a hot mess. You know what I mean? But you love them anyway, even though they can be a disaster at times. <laughs> and I think I relate to that because I feel like I'm Peter so many times. Like we're in one moment. Jesus is like, you know, I love you and you're, you know, you're with me. And the next moment he's saying, get behind me, Satan. You know, it's like just that dichotomy of, of how relationships work sometimes. Sometimes we're so all in and sometimes we just struggle. And you see Peter struggle a lot as he just kind yeah. of um, sometimes fumbles through. And to me, he's relatable. <laughs> like I just see yeah. me relate to him. And I just, I so appreciate I so appreciate their relationship because, um, again, that's how Christ, I think, handles me sometimes with sometimes a hard hand, sometimes uh, with that compassion and love that I need, um, hard truth, you know, all of those elements is is how Christ deals with me, too. So um, I guess I can see a lot of myself in Peter and I appreciate the relationship he has with Jesus. Yeah, for sure. Tasha, is there one that... Uh that you appreciate? The first one I always think about is David and Jonathan. Yeah. Like that. Because when you think of friendship, you think of those two and just how they showed up for each other and they weren't, yeah. like, can always, like, physically be there for each other or, like, show up and we're doing every single day together. But, like, when it really mattered, they were. Yeah, they were, they were there for each other for sure. Sacrifices they had to make. But. Yeah. Rick, how about you? I love the story of the paralytic uh, who gets brought to Jesus by his friends. Uh, yeah. And is healed not because of his own faith, because mm -hmm. he's healed because of the faith of his friends. Um, yeah. And, you know, I love that because so many times we need the faith of our friends to sustain us a bit. Um, mm -hmm. And so I really relate to that story sometimes. And it just, I just, it's just a neat story when it talks about the importance of having a strong inner circle, a strong friend circle, like that paralytic is not healed if not for his friends. Um, so yeah, that, that's the one that really sticks out to me. Yeah. I think for me, this is going to be a weird one. Um, but sometimes that's where my mind goes. Uh, one of the friendships that I have always loved has one side that's terrible. Um, and that's David and his mighty warriors. Mm -hmm. And the main one being Uriah. Like those men would have done anything and did do anything for David. 
like they laid their life on the line on a regular basis before he was king. And yes, he was promised and he was he was the one that was, you know, said you are anointed the next king. And they kept saying, let's take Saul right now. And, and David would say, no, no. Um, but it was such a tight bond that I've never experienced. I've never been in war. Rick, we've talked about a little bit how there's a there's a different bond when you're in war with someone, you know. Um, and I can only take all the military people in my life's word for it, you know, because I've never been there. But I can imagine it would just be so different. Um, and then to see, and I know it's it's brutal to think about this way because David, I mean, we just, once again, we're shown how awful David is as a human in so many ways. And there's so many good examples as well of David and being a man after God's own heart. But like to the end, to his death, he was still loyal to David mm -hmm. and what he felt God called him to. Um, and like, that's just, it's a loyalty that like has always been something that has inspired me um, to really try to be that loyal in friendships and to, uh, to, to go that extra mile. And obviously Uriah was clueless of what was going on. Mm -hmm. Um, but like, but that didn't matter because he was loyal to the end. And, and it just, uh, it, yeah, it's, it's something that I've always appreciated um, and really does, you know, uh, inspire me to, if I'm going to be choosy about who who's in my foxhole, so to speak, like, man, I better be loyal to him mm -hmm. um, in a godly way and in a godly manner. Um, well, thank you guys, uh, as always, for the conversation and the discussion. Um, it, it is something that uh, great reminders today of really the only the only one we need is God. But God puts individuals in our life. God puts people in our life to, to be um, his tool that he uses uh, as iron to sharpen our iron. And we're put in other people's lives to, to do that same thing. Um, and so, uh, yeah, those of you that are watching or listening, I want to encourage you to continue to walk that path. Continue to seek God. Uh, and as, as you're walking beside someone um, in those hard times, in those struggles, be prayed up before, during, and after. Um, and really uh, let the uh, Holy Spirit speak through you in those situations. Well, thank you for joining us uh, on Federated Squared Circle Wrestling with God's Word. We'll see you next week.